Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, but as you know, we're studying the Gospel of Luke, finishing up uh, the Gospel in total. We are on the last two verses of uh, that book in the last chapter, chapter 24, in verses 52 and 53. And those two passages, and I'll just read those to you, it says, And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising God. And that's how Luke ends his gospel, by talking about the praise and worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of God himself, both at the time of the ascension and then following days uh, in Jerusalem, as they also returned to Jerusalem right after the ascension. But what we're focusing on today is what it says in the second half of this verse, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And so we understand the emotion that they had in the heart of their soul based on the word of God and ultimately witnessing the things and events that they had seen, especially seeing Jesus Christ uh, arise and go into the clouds of the air, disappear from their sight, and then have two angels appear before them, telling them that why are you looking at the air and continuing to stare up there as you saw him leave, though he will return. He will return the exact same way. So there they had the full information of Jesus Christ's ascension, his session being seated at the right hand of God the Father, and then they also recognized the doctrine of his coming, his second coming, where he would return one day. And all of that information that they now had in the heart of their soul gave them great joy. And God, as you know, has given us emotions that so they don't lead us in things and lead us in life, but they respond to the things in life, respond to the situations that we're in, respond to the Word of God resident in our soul, and respond to our relationship with God on a consistent basis. Our emotions are a response function that should lead us in our praise and worship of God as well. <clears throat> And as a result of seeing this and what they had in the heart of their soul and what they continued to have as they walked back to Jerusalem and as they continued going forward now in their personal ministries, we recognize that they had great joy. Now the Greek here is mega, and that's where we get our word megas from. Again, mega meaning large, great, exorbitant, we could say. And then kara is the Greek word there for joy. And that is a word that we see many times throughout the New Testament that speaks about the joy that we are to have in the heart of our soul, but also how we can respond on the outward actions that we perform as well. As we were singing, hopefully you had a smile upon your face in the great song in the joy that you had worshiping our God. So this also follows along with what we just studied in regard to our worship of God, how there are two aspects of that, the inward worship and then the outward worship that we have of our God. The subjective, because again, it's our inward, what's going on in the mentality of our soul, and that's subjective to you and each individual here and all Christians throughout time have their own inward worship of God based on the knowledge that they have of God and their personality and who they are and how they respond in that. So it's subjective based on the individual. That's the inward worship that we have of God, how we take in the word and apply that on a consistent basis. Then the second aspect of our worship is how we then respond and show the outward projection of our joy, our happiness, and our praise and our worship of God, our glorification of God as it were. And part of that outward or the objective, and again, the objective is because now it's based on the Word of God resident within your soul. Yes, you are still the one doing it, but it's based on the Word of God and what God says about how we appropriately worship Him on a consistent basis. So it's the objective rather than the subjective, but it's always in the outward expression of our praise and our worship of our God. As you're doing this morning, you've come to learn the Word of God. That's part of your objective, uh, inward and also outward expression of your worship of God. We just sang beautiful songs. We had a prayer. That's part of our objective or our outward expression of our praise and our worship of God. Now, as we've noted that doctrine of worship and how we should appropriately be worshiping our God, we also recognize now the second half of this sentence where we are to have the joy of God, the happiness of God, inward and now expressing on the outward of our soul. 
and inwardly in regard to our emotions, as I said, our emotions should be responding to the Word of God. When we fully understand what the Word of God has to say, when we fully understand what the Word of God tells us about our relationship with Him, our emotions can respond. And sometimes with great joy and happiness, where we are uh, laughing and giggling, as it were, or just expressing our joy because of uh, the music that we're singing or whatever we might be doing. But sometimes you know that can also bring tears. And they are tears of joy in regard, even though you have this sorrow, tearful uh, emotion coming from your soul, sometimes those tears come because we are just so in awe of the recognition of what God has done for us. So again, when we fully understand our right relationship with God and we experience the things of God in our lives, inwardly our emotions can well up and then be expressed on the outward uh, side of our body where we express the happiness and joy and the rejoicing that, we, that comes with knowing who and what our God is. So first it starts with inwardly. Our emotions now uh, go forward in response to the Word of God resident within our soul. Therefore, we also then are experiencing the happiness of God. And as we also uh, study those problem-solving devices that God gives to us in His Scriptures, remember one of them is sharing in the happiness of God. You see, God is happy. One of the attributes, one of the essence of God is that He is happy. And He is always happy in all the things that He does. He is happy. He has joy constantly, 24-7, and for all of eternity. God wants us to have His joy, His happiness, resident within our soul as well. And the more we know of the Word of God, the more we apply that Word within our life, the more we experience the happiness of God in our lives each and every day. And God wants us to have that happiness, and therefore He gives us His Word, He gives us His Spirit, He gives us the ability to comprehend and understand these things, so then the emotions that He built inside of us can respond to those things. Again, another topic for another day is our emotions. It's a whole doctrine unto itself. But what we recognize from that doctrine, what the Word of God says in regard to our emotions, is that they should never lead us. Because when we get our emotions out front and we're led by our emotions, we're led by our feelings, that's when we can have emotional revolt of the soul. Where again, we are doing a frantic search of happiness, so we always have this high of this joy, 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 joy. Or we can go the other way where we have a constant state of fear, worry, and anxiety. We don't let our emotions control. What we do is let our emotions respond and respond appropriately to the Word of God resonant within our soul. And therefore, uh, having control over the emotions rather than letting them lead us around, you know, by the nose, as it were. So inwardly, our emotions respond to the Word of God so that we can experience the happiness of God. And then that is expressed on the outside in our words, in our actions, and in our deeds. And as it says here, they were uh, continually having great joy as they walked back to Jerusalem. So they just praised and worshipped God right in that place where they saw Him ascend as they were standing in Bethany on the Mount of Olivet. But ultimately they saw Him go, and they had great praise. They worshipped Him, they honored Him with their words and their actions and uh, whatever uh, camaraderie they might have had there, one with the other. But at the same time, it brought great joy to their souls. And that joy just wasn't a fleeting moment. It wasn't just the time that they saw him ascend and, okay, five, ten minutes later, he's gone. We're still standing around. Now what do we do? No. What do we do? We walk back to Jerusalem. And we continue to think about all that we know, all that we've seen, all that we've heard about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we go forward in sharing that and understanding it and worshiping our God on a continual basis. And that's what they did. They walked all the way back to Jerusalem, and they kept proclaiming the joy and happiness that was in their soul. They got back to Jerusalem, and they started to tell everybody and share their experience with other people and express the joy and happiness that they had in their own soul, now knowing these things, what Jesus Christ had fulfilled and accomplished in his first advent, and then what Jesus Christ will continue to uh, fulfill or in the future of his second advent everything in between, because now he's seated at the right hand of the Father in what we call the session, and he is there now as the great mediator 
for the church. And so therefore we recognize the continual ministry of Jesus Christ. They recognize the continual ministry of Jesus Christ. And they have joy in the heart of their soul knowing these things. And that's what we need to have as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as well. So in regard to that, we're going to now get into the doctrine of joy, okay? And uh, basically we just say principles of joy, and that's all that that a doctrine is, the principles that are found in the Word of God. But we're going to talk about joy. Now it's interesting, I'm going to show you a couple of passages today in the first aspect of the introduction to this, and then getting into some of the uh, more detailed principles. But in regard to this, uh, we've seen this a number of different times in the Gospel of Luke, but we haven't delved into it in any depth. And in fact, I went back over my notes and looked at the doctrines that I have in regard to the doctrine of joy, and it's probably been 14 years since I taught this in detail by itself. Now we talk about joy all the time, but in the principles of joy and how it's found in the New Testament and in the Old Testament and what God says about we having joy in the heart of our soul. I haven't done a detailed study of that in some time, so I thought it good to do that now. All right, so that's what we're going to do, and we'll spend a a few sessions on that as we go forward. But first and foremost, we talk about the Greek word. Kara is the Greek word, comes from Cairo, which is the primary root verb. And Cairo by itself means to rejoice, be glad. And so therefore, it's the verb, so it's the action of joy. It's the expression of joy. Here we have the noun. And here we have the noun kara, which is joy, delight, having gladness or happiness. And you know a noun is a person, place, or a thing. And in this case, it's a thing. It's an emotion that God has given to us that we can experience and express. So that's what this is talking about here in this passage, the joy that we are to have in the heart of our soul. And it's not necessarily emphasizing the expression of joy or the action of rejoicing, but it's talking about what's going on in the mentality of your soul. Are you a happy person? Let me ask you that question. Nobody answer, please. I don't want to know. All right? All right, don't raise your hands, okay? But the fact is, are you a happy person? You see, you should be. If you have the Word of God resident in your soul, you should be happy about 99% of the time, okay? 99% of the time, you should be happy. And if you're not happy, it means you're truly not either learning or applying the Word of God in faith. Because you're not looking at God and His Word and saying, He's got it all under control. He's got it all laid out. He's providing me everything necessary. He's got a plan for me. He's done great things for me. Just looking at the cross and what He did for me to save me from my sins, that alone, I'm not going to be eternally condemned. I'm going to be with God forever and ever, for all of eternity. That alone should make you happy. But if we're not thinking about God, if we're not thinking about His Word, and instead we're thinking about the world and what this problem is and that problem is and what the world could do to me or what this person might do to me, and we have fear, worry, and anxiety, and we have paranoia about all that's going on around us, guess what? We will not be happy. Why? Because we're looking at the wrong thing. We're not keeping our eyes on the things above. Instead, we're keeping our eyes on the things here below the earthly, the material, that are part of Satan's cosmic system. And yes, if you look at Satan's cosmic system, you should be depressed, okay? Because he ain't got a good system, okay? And it's a system designed for sin and evil and exclusion of God within your life. And if that's what you're looking at, if you're looking at the things of this world, I always point over there when I talk about the world because that's our front door, and that's <laughs> the world is out there, okay? We're right here right now, okay? But in any case, if you think, why is he pointing there all the time? That's outside, all right? In any case, <laughs> if we're looking at those things, we are not sharing in the happiness of God. You think these things worry God? You think the world and Satan and his cosmic system worry God? No. He's got it under control. And in fact, he's had it under control from eternity past, and he has it so much under control that he could write about it in the Bible, his word, and tell us about it and what he's going to do about it before it comes to fruition. I mean, you know what's happening in the tribulation. 
You know it's coming uh, for the millennial reign. You know it's going to happen in the future. And how Satan and sin is going to be bound up literally for all of eternity and done away with. Because he won the victory already at the cross. And in the future he can do these other things. You see, if we are not focusing on our relationship with God and having his word cycle through our soul, we're not going to be happy. But if we do, we should be happy. Because God is happy. And that means his word is happiness that is presented to us. And God desires us to have his joy resident within our soul. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the stories of, you know, the early church and uh, uh, during the d uh, days of Rome and the Roman Colosseums and the uh, uh, evil and that used to go on and throwing the Christians to the lions and the gladiators and all that good stuff that used to happen back in the day. Well, you've probably also heard the stories how they were singing songs and praising God as they were about to lose their lives. They were singing praises to God. Now, why were they able to do that? Because they were focused in the right thing. Not their life, not this physical flesh, not what's going to happen to me, but my God and what he has done for me and what he has waiting for me. You see, therefore, regardless of the situation that we're in, we can be happy internally and express it outwardly in the prob uh, situation or difficulty or problem that we may be in. And isn't it interesting that as the church was persecuted more in, those early, in that early first century, as it was persecuted more than it ever has been throughout human history, isn't it interesting that the church flourished more? And why is that? Because the positive believers demonstrated what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a believer, because they had the happiness in their soul, and they were able to express that even in those times of great persecution. So in the active sense, when we talk about kara, we have joy in something or resulting from an experience that we have gone through. And again, we can have experiences in the world of, you know, seeing our grandchildren be born or our children being born or having a happy event happen, you know, somebody's birthday, and we sing happy birthday, okay? There's an experience, there an, is an event. And from those, we can also have the happiness that God has given to us. But when we recognize the Word of God and we see Him working within our lives, which you should be each and every day, you see how he's working and uh, uh, leading you and guiding you in all things. You should have that happiness from the experience and from what you're going through and seeing his word flourish in your soul and seeing him work out the details of your life on a daily basis. I mean, heck, we've been here as a church for 23 years now. 23 years. Who would have thought 23 years ago we'd still be here? Okay, But we are. We're still here. And we're going forward in the plan of God. And so as a result of these disciples seeing the ascension and session of Jesus Christ, they truly had an event. They had an event. And they responded to that event of God in great joy and happiness and worship. But it wasn't just the event. It was what they learned through the event. And what they knew as a result of the teachings of Christ and the angels that were there with them. And now putting that all together, along with the event, that they were able to have this type of joy. And not just joy, but great joy. Mega joy in their life. So again, let me ask you a question. Are you happy in this life? Let me ask you a different way. Are you mega happy in this life? Are you greatly joyous in this life? And the answer should be, yes, I am. That should be the answer. Not, well, you know, this is things happening over here, and that thing's happening over here, and the world is like this, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's evil in the world. We know that. Get over it. Because that does not control you. What controls you is God and his word. And what is going on is what God is doing in your life each and every day. So again, don't focus on the things of this world for your feelings, and certainly not from a position of your feelings. 
Don't look at the world to make you happy. Don't look at things of this world to make you happy. Have the word of God resonant in your soul and let it lead you to be happy. And happy greatly. Mega joy. The uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that the eschatological significance of joy, and this is kind of interesting, where, again, we're looking eschatological, I say that slowly, that basically is talking about the future and God's prophecy of what's going to happen in the future. So the future significance of joy is connected with also what we recognize from the Bible as being hope. And what is hope? Well, we should know hope. Okay, I talk about it all the time. And hope isn't, I wish it were going to happen, but I'm not, I don't think it's going to, but I wish it were. No, that's not hope. The hope of the Bible is a confident expectation of what is going to happen and what is going to occur. And so therefore, from a biblical standpoint and the significance of joy, we see that many times joy is connected with us knowing confidently in what God has for us in the future. And so what does that say? When you know the word of God and you know that you have eternal security and you know that you're going to be in heaven with God forever and ever, you know that right now you're the bride, one day you're going to be the wife. You know that you're the body of Jesus Christ and he is the head and one day you're going to sit on the throne with him as his body as he is the head. When you know the things of the rapture and the tribulation and the millennial reign and the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, when you know your salvation and the eternal joy, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, when you know these things now, because God has said this is going to happen in the future, and you confidently look to those things and say, I know it's going to happen, that's hope. And with that, it brings great joy. Because you don't have to worry about this, that, or the other thing. You just go about your day and do it unto God each and every day. And let him continue to provide for you each and every day. So therefore, our confident expectation, as we recognize, is when we wait on the timing of God and look forward to the things that God is going to do. Let's go to the book of Colossians. I know I had you turn there already. i got to get there myself. I'm still back in uh, the Gospel of Luke. I'm doing it page by page. I need to turn my pages faster. All right, so in Colossians chapter 1, in verses 9 through 12, it says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's the context of this passage, okay? The knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that you will what? Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Again, not walking in sin, but walking filled with the Spirit each and every day. To please him in all respects. Bearing fruit. Again, we call that divine good production. In every good work and increasing what? In the knowledge of God. So the whole context here, and we just have it bookend, praying that you be filled with the knowledge of his will, and that increasing in the knowledge of God at the end of verse 10. Now verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Steadfastness and patience, waiting on the timing of God. And then what does it say? Joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And what is it? Joyously giving thanks to the Father. You see, with joy and happiness, the joy of God, expressing that and giving thanks to God the Father, because we know what he has done for us and we understand what the future holds the inheritance that is waiting for us. So again, the eschatological significance of joy is connected with that confident expectation that God is going to do something for us one day. And we believe it. His word says it, therefore we believe it. And in faith, we walk in it each and every day. 
In another uh, commentary, another lexicon, Colin Brown lexicon, he quotes a fellow by the name of By Ruther, and that individual says, it is no coincidence that the words appear particularly where there is express mention of the eschatological fulfillment in Christ, of being in him and hope and of hope in him, the whole New Testament message of God's saving work in Christ is a message of joy. So again, when we recognize what God has promised to us in the future because of what Jesus has done for us in the past at the cross, the whole message of Christ should bring us joy. The whole message of our salvation should bring us joy. The whole message of our spiritual walk should be one of joy. Of God's saving work in Christ is a message of joy. Now, a couple uh, uh, in regard to the Hebrew as well, because again, we have the Hebrew language, you got the Greek language, Old Testament, New Testament. In the Hebrew, there is the one specific word that is a synonymous with our word kara, which is simcha. And simcha does mean joy or gladness. And that is used a number of different times uh, in the Old Testament. I'm giving you uh, uh, three of those passages here. I'll show you those on the board in just a minute. And then after that, there are a couple other words that we also see in the Hebrew of the Old Testament that also speak about joy, but also the expression of our joy in our actions and in our deeds. And so in Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11, it says, You will make known to me the path of life. In other words, God's going to tell me how I should be walking each and every day. In your presence is fullness of joy. You see, when I'm in the presence of God, I have the fullness of joy. Now, when are you in the presence of God? You don't have to answer that question. It's all okay, okay? Always. You have the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. You have the indwelling of Jesus Christ the Son. You have the indwelling of God the Father. You are always in the presence of God. And oh, by the way, God is everywhere at the same time. He's, every, he's omnipresent. So we're always in the presence of God. But in the mentality of my soul, am I always in the presence of God? No. You see, when I walk in sin, when I get involved in uh, the things of Satan's cosmic system, and get involved in sin and human good and evil, and I step outside of my relationship with God, even though I'm around God and still in His presence, in the mentality of my soul, I'm not thinking in those terms. And that's when we lose our joy. That's when we lose our happiness, when we walk outside of the filling and fellowship of God. And then I love what it says, in your right hand there are pleasures forever. You notice the eschatological significance of a confident expectation. In your right hand, and the right hand is a symbol and representation of power and strength, in the power and strength of God, in the majesty of who God is, there are joys and pleasures for all of eternity. You see, God gives it to us in time, and your presence is fullness of joy right now, as well as what you've promised me for the future as well, that I absolutely have confident expectation in. In Psalm 119, verse 11, I have inherited your testimonies forever. In other words, your word, the Bible doctrine, is now resident within my soul, for they are what? The joy of my heart. You see, your word is the joy of of my heart. That's what gives us joy. That's what gives us happiness. Or at least it should. You see, that's God's design for your joy and happiness, to have His Word resident within your soul. For they are the joy of my heart. And then in Psalm chapter 149, verse 5, it says, Let the godly ones exalt in glory. And again, exalt in glory. Again, giving God the glory, giving Him praise. Part of our exaltation of God. That too is part of our happiness as it says, Let them shout for joy on their beds. And again, when you lay down at, at night and uh, you know are, are going to sleep. And again, that word there as well can also mean in the Hebrew couch. Okay, So at times of relaxation, a time when you're reclining, whether it be in bed or on the couch or in a chair, whatever the case may be, and you now are thinking about the things of God, you can shout and sing for joy. Has anybody ever done that on, when they're laying in bed? Okay. Sometimes I just, I, I, I've shouted for joy. My wife's like, what are you doing? You're waking me up. Be quiet. No, I'm just kidding. All right. But you have that startling moment, okay? But again, 
let them shout for joy on their beds. Now, whether you do that with your mouth and audibly sing out loud, okay, you may do that, okay, but you can do that right up here as well. And you can sing to God in the heart of your soul and sing to God and give him praise and do it with shouts of joy as you're there laying at bed getting ready to go to sleep as you say your nightly prayers or whatever uh, you may be doing or thinking or just going over the word of God in the mentality of your soul at that point in time. Let them shout for joy on their beds. So in the Hebrew also we have uh, a phrase sing for joy which is made up of the Hebrew word rana and this is a verb so this is the expression of joy that uh, is utilized throughout the Old Testament and it means to give a ringing cry a ringing cry the cries of joy joyful singing is how this word is used and applied throughout the Old Testament and so we see that we can have the ringing cry again calling out to God calling out to God whether we do it uh, in the heart of our soul or whether we do it audibly with our words singing a song singing praises uh, reciting one of the Psalms, whatever the case may be. We can do that, and we do it joyfully, and we express the joy that we have to God in our song. You know, there's a reason why God called David the man after my own heart. And David seemed to have be, ha, seems to have been the greatest writer of biblical songs of all time. You ever think about that? All the Psalms that he wrote? All these songs. Okay, And even some that other people wrote, he was commissioning them to write these songs and do it unto God. And the reason that God says he was a man after my own heart was, yeah, because he's you know, constantly seeking out my word. And that's really the major emphasis there. But why David? A lot of people have sought out God. You know? Didn't Moses seek out God? Didn't Paul seek out God? Okay? But David, the greatest songwriter of biblical songs of all time. So again, we see how the singing is very important. And again, if you, uh, I'm not a singer. I can't sing a lick, okay? So that doesn't mean I'm not a man after God's own heart, okay? But again, in the mentality of your soul, you can recite the song and just have that joy and praise of God in any way, in any form, in any fashion. It's part of our right relationship with God and the expression of our appreciation for Him when we have the emotions coming forward with what we know about our God and then singing his praises for those things. As it says in Psalm 511, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy and may you shelter them that those who love your name may exalt in you. So take your refuge in God. Yeah, the world's coming after you. Oh, this problem, this difficulty, that difficulty. Am I going to let those things bother me? Am I going to, you know, have fear, worry, and anxiety overtake me? That's what Satan wants. But if you take your refuge in God, God, you've got this. God, lead me. Help me to overcome. Protect me. Guide me. Provide for me. Whatever the case, sing for joy when you take that refuge. And praise God because he gives you that refuge. And the mentality of your soul will respond in joy. We also have another Hebrew word, which is rana, which is a ringing cry, joy or joyful shouting, joyful singing, also used throughout the uh, Old Testament as well. And again, continuing uh, in understanding in Psalm chapter 107, verse 22, let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with what? Joyful singing. Let them offer their sacrifices of thanksgiving. And that was a specific type of offering uh, back in the ancient day, as we know, the thanksgiving offering. But as we do not have to commit sacrifices any longer in that way of the animal sacrifices, because Christ fulfilled the law, and all sacrifices are now null and void because there's the one perfect sacrifice, we have sacrifices in the mentality of our soul of what am I going to give up for God. I could go and live in that pleasurable sin. I could go and do that. And that would make me have some, you know, emotional high. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sacrifice that. 
but instead I'm going to tell of the works of my God. And that is what's going to bring me happiness. So sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. As it also says in Psalm 126, verses 2 and 3, Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And again, a recognition of what God did for the people and nation of Israel. And how other nations are also looking at it, and are at awe and at envy. And then think of the United States of America today as we now are the client nation unto God currently. We could lose that client nation status, okay, which is the favorable nation where God blesses so they can send out missionaries and evangelists and have great churches within their own borders. But it's a result of positive volition and faith of believers growing and coming up and spreading that word. And look what God has done with the United States of America over our almost 250 year worth uh, of history. And even before that, when you know the early, early settlers came in, look what God has done. And the world is at awe of the nation that we are, with the freedoms that we have. And a lot of them are scratching their heads. You go to a communist country or some of these socialist countries or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-Christian countries, and they're scratching their heads saying, they have all this freedom. And yeah, I know freedom can be used for evil, but freedom is also designed for good. And they scratch their head like, how can they be so prosperous? Well, it's not because of who and what we are. It's because of our God and what he has done for us and how he has blessed us as a people and a nation. Do you think the Israelites were all perfect believers, praising Jesus all the time? How many times did they rebel? How many times did they doubt? How many times did they try to go to the pagan gods over and over and over again? But God blessed them because he chose them. And he did great things for them. And in recognition of the great things that God does for us today in our own nation, let us joyfully shout unto the Lord and praise him and glorify him in thanksgiving. So that was all just etymology, okay? But a lot of principles come out of that, okay? Now I want to get into uh, a couple of principles uh, that we'll do with the time we have left. And we're going to do communion uh, in regard to the same topic in just a minute. But Luke's use of kara is really the most expansive of all the writers of the New Testament. Okay? He, he actually uh, utilizes it more than any other writer. More than John, who loved the Lord. More than Matthew and Mark, and even more than Paul. Luke really emphasized throughout his gospel the joy that God provides for, for the believer and the joy we should have as well. And with that, we see the emphasis in regard to his gospel, how it's associated with our salvation and everything involved and everything around that. And so let's go there. Let's go to Luke. We're going to look at a couple of passages in Luke. We'll actually look at those in our Bibles. Let's go back to the gospel of Luke chapter 2. And in uh, Luke 2, chap uh, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10, what is this? This is the birth announcement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is, uh, uh, in essence, when uh, the angels gave the announcement to the shepherds out in the field. And in verse 10, it says, The angels said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be... For all the people. I bring you good news of great joy. Okay? <laughs> good news of great joy. What is that? The Savior has come. He's here. He's there now. And now joy should be in the presence of the heart of all who recognize and understand that and believe it. And for their generation, it was there. Now for our generation, we look back and we still look back with great joy because we know the Savior has come. And he has won that strategic victory of the angelic conflict and defeated sin and Satan at the cross, providing salvation for all of mankind. And in regard to that, our joy then responds to what God has done, seeing God work, knowing his uh, past work, 
and recognizing what God has already provided for us, as we've also previously talked about what he's going to do in the future as well. It's a response to seeing how God is working and how he specifically worked through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then the subsequent followers that we see about in the book of Acts and then the rest of the New Testament. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Let's go there. And this is the story, and again, we studied the whole Gospel of Luke, so you should be familiar with this, but this is when uh, Jesus sent out 70 disciples to go out and uh, witness and evangelize, and they performed various miracles. They had power to do that at that point in time. In verse 17, And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In other words, they were able to exercise demons in the name of Jesus Christ. They saw the power and the work of God as they went out on the missionary field. And they came back and reported that with great joy because they experienced the power of God. And they saw it. And again, when we see God working in our life, when we see him put things together, like how could that happen or how did this come together? And, or you say, okay, and I can put X, you know, 2020 hindsight is awesome, Okay. <laughs> I love looking back and saying, oh, now I see, okay? Because when you're going through it, and again, the more experience you get at it, the more you recognize and you say, okay, I, I see what God's doing here. I know where he's going with this. I do. But when you look back, you really can see the whole picture. And he put this together, he put that together, he did this thing, he did that thing, so that you would be at a place where you are now. And it's beautiful to see God's work in your life. And that should give you joy as well. Let's go to chapter 19 in verse 37. Chapter 19 in verse 37. And it says here, it says uh, in verse 37, make sure I'm in the right place, yep. It says, and he... And, and as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And what is that? The triumphal entry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they were praising him. And they saw the King coming. And they recognized that ultimately God's promise of a kingdom would be fulfilled. Unfortunately, many of them didn't see the cross before the crown, but we know the 2020 hindsight story. The cross has to come, then the crown. But in seeing that the crown was coming, they rejoiced because God had promised them the kingdom for eons and eons and eons. All right, let's also go back to uh, chapter 13. I'll have to go back now to chapter 13, verse 7 since we're in Luke. Again, uh, verse 17, chapter 13, verse 17. And here he says, again, after um, you know, railing after some of the Pharisees, and he sa it says, And as he said this, all his opponents were being humili humiliated, and the entire multitude was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. So seeing what Jesus Christ was doing, his preaching, his teaching, all that he was doing, they were rejoicing. And then what we recognize, it also is a characteristic of our faith. Let's go back to uh, chapter 8 and verse 13. Here we see the parables, chapter 8, verse 13, of the different soils, as you know. And in verse 13, it says, And those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Now, I should probably just stop there, okay? Because that's what it's all about. They hear the word, they receive it with joy. You see, these people receive the gospel, and they are saved. 
And as a result of knowing that they're saved and their sins have been paid for, they are rejoicing. They're rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing. But unfortunately, because they have the rocky soil type of soul, as the second half says, and you can read that on your own, basically when the sun comes out, they wither away. And again, when the heat turns up, they wither away. When the first problem comes, they wither away. Because they didn't continue to supplement you know, their uh, soil of their soul with the word of God. And they turn away. But the point is, when they first heard of salvation and received it, in other words, they repented and they had salvation, they had what? Great joy. All right, go to chapter 15 and verse 7, where we see a similar analogy in regard to our salvation. Because in Luke chapter 15 and verses 7, and I'll read down uh, through verse 10. It's actually in verse 7 and 10. He goes, it says in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has, uh, has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there we see, both uh, in regard to salvation of an individual, the individual has joy, knowing that their sins have been paid for. They have salvation, and at the same time, there's rejoicing in heaven where the angels are recognizing what Jesus Christ has done for them and what that individual has now received. And then our last point, and let me just get this in, and then we'll get to our communion. Seeing the fulfillment of God's plan, His promises, His purpose for your life, that too brings joy within the heart of our soul. So not only at salvation, but the ongoing walk that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll pick it up on Tuesday uh, with that point in the following, but let me just give you First Peter chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you did not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And that's what we should be doing each and every day. Because we don't see him now, but yet we do love him. You're here today because you love God and you love his word. You love his son, Jesus Christ. You do not see him, but you do believe in him. So as a result of his word being resident in your soul, knowing what God has done for you in the past, what he's going to do in your future, and what he's doing for you right now, we have joy, inexpressible, rejoicing greatly, full of glory, which is praise and honor in our worship of our God. So again, I hope you're seeing the connections too between what we just studied about worshiping and now this doctrine of joy and how the two go hand in hand. Because part of our worship of God is having his happiness resident within our soul that we can then express to him on a consistent basis. All right, so uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us your happiness and uh, uh, sharing that with us. And we just ask, Father, that your happiness come into our soul more and more each and every day by the word and by your spirit that teaches us that word so that we rejoice and praise and honor and glorify you more and more each and every day. So we ask that you now be with us in uh, the remaining portions of our service. In Christ's name, amen.